This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. Hello and thank you so much for joining us on this momentous day at Joy 94.9. My name is Daniel Gardner and it is seven minutes past 12 uh, on this glorious day. Uh, and just a quick m bit of mental arithmetic, if I can just work out, it's actually 6.30 a.m. in Mumbai and also 8 p.m. yesterday in New York. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, yes, you join me uh, on, a, on a wonderful sunny day in Melbourne town, uh, which is the traditional home of the Wurundjeri people, the great Kulin nation, and it is their homeland that we are broadcasting from today. We pay our respects to the elders and to the other Aboriginal elders and Aboriginal people who may be listening today. Uh, the Joy Studio has undergone a dramatic transformation over the last few days. Uh, I've never seen so many televisions. It looks like JB Hi-Fi out there. Uh, and the only other notable difference is that I didn't have to do my own uh, hair and makeup this morning, which is another advantage. Um, we are doing the, uh, the World AIDS Day uh, broadcast today, not just on air as normal, but we are very much visual today, as you can see from the testament. I am on camera now, hopefully. Uh, if you are listening on air, then why? We have this amazing media which is visual today. Uh, you can log on to worldaidsdayworldwide.org and see all our glorious faces there. Uh, we are picking up a topic that uh, Dean opened with earlier today, and that is the where are we now? And if you don't believe me, you should be able to see it written across the top of the screen about there. And if you can't see it, you probably have to refresh your page. These are basic internet skills, guys. I shouldn't be having to tell you this. Uh, uh, um, underneath that umbrella topic, we are also talking about the uh, ageing HIV population today. Not sure whether I'm particularly keen on being picked for that. I don't know whether, you know, I'm, I, mean, I know I'm no spring chicken or anything, but uh, you know, whether I should be the one to talk about ageing population, I'm not sure. Um, I can't bear this uh, brunt alone. I am joined by some splendid people in the studio, uh, and thankfully they are all in the studio because Skype has a funny effect on me. Um, first of all to introduce is Carolyn McDonald, a researcher at Monash University looking into HIV and the ageing population. Uh, we also have Paul Mathewson, who is a franchisee holder for uh, one of the 20 HISC offices Australia-wide. HISC, I found out, is not the Hunter Ice Skating Club of America. It is actually the Home Instead Senior care service. Uh, we're also joined by uh, my final guest, uh, Sebastian Aristos, uh, who is a member of the Positive Speakers Bureau in Melbourne and also is involved with um, Positive uh, Living of Victoria Association. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us. It is a big day, lots to get through. We're specifically talking about the uh, ageing uh, com community of HIV. So um, I suppose the best thing to do is kick off saying that the fact that we're able to have this conversation about uh, people living with HIV and getting older is a good thing. Because, of course, a few years ago, it was considered that people weren't going to live very long. Now, of course, we have amazing treatment, a lot of research going on in, d in the, s the various sciences surrounding. Uh, and uh, it is certainly not without question for people living with HIV to leave, uh, lead a very long and healthy life. Um, I will return first of all, who am I going to pick first? Uh, oh, excellent. Well, <laughs> Carolyn's shaking her head, which instantly means I'm going to go for you. Um, uh, a little bit more about you, uh, Carolyn. You are, as I say before, a researcher at Monash University. Um, now, you are just about to complete phase one of your research, which I believe looked at um, people living with HIV between the ages of 45 and all the way up to 82, I think was the, the oldest uh, per individual you were uh, looking at. Um, and you're about to commence phase two uh, of the Positive Aging Project. Tell us a little bit more about what your, your research encompasses and, and what you're hoping to do. Okay, well, the project um, that we're running is funded by the Victorian Department of Health. And it's, um, it was, a, it was a, um, a commitment made by the minister, an election commitment, and he gave the money to the Alfred Hospital to the Infectious Diseases uh, Department, which is also a department of Monash University, which is where I come in. And that, so with that uh, project, the, f the first phase of the project, we did a qualitative study and interviewed 30 people ageing with HIV in the age range that you just described. And we also spoke with eight carers of um, some of those uh, participants. And then we, we, we had a number of other components as part of phase one, which included um, some epidemiological profiling of HIV in Victoria and ageing. Uh, and some service mapping uh, in terms of mainstream and HIV services that are available for both people ageing with HIV but also ageing Victorians in general. And then phase two of the project, which we're uh, launching officially today, but we're, you know, we'll, I guess momentum will develop over the next uh, coming month, 
involves a um, three or three components to that project. It's a, a health promotion campaign which we're doing in partnership with the Victorian AIDS Council. Um, to try and get some positive messaging out there about ageing and HIV. As you said, it is a, um, an event that is worth celebrating. Um, but, but generally, and, and I guess we'll get into this as we go, but um, a lot of our participants felt that they didn't have enough information about ageing, so we wanted to address that in phase two. So we're also developing a website which will um, have lots of information about what we know about ageing as well as all of the services that are available. Um, and then the final component is some health coaching for participants who would like to refer themselves into that coaching program or their doctors or um, caseworkers may choose to do that. And that's to help people problem solve around some of the issues around ageing. It's quite extensive research you're doing then and it's encompassing quite a lot of different areas. Um, is this, uh, was the research embarked upon because you realised there wasn't enough support for people, uh, particularly in an ageing community? I think um, primarily it was just that we didn't actually know very much about this population. I mean, as you said, it's a relatively new phenomenon, the experience of ageing with HIV. So we just needed to start really at... Um, at the beginning and say, well, what are the experiences for um, Victorians who are ageing with HIV? So that, that was why we did the exploratory in-depth qualitative study that we did. Um, there has been, you know, bits of bits and pieces of research done in this area, both in America and the UK, um, but it's still very much at its preliminary stages. So um, we just wanted to go out there and ask people what they felt they needed or what they wanted to know or um, and then and then develop the project around that. Speaking about HIV and AIDS, um, it is, it's, it's, to be honest, quite tricky ground occasionally. You know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of emotion involved and it's, you know, it's people's lives we're talking about here. Um, there's only one thing which is only slightly more tricky to talk about and that is people's age. Uh, and I'm going to step around this one as gingerly as I possibly can. Uh, and in no way or coincidentally am I going to introduce the uh, re return to our next guest, uh, Sebastian Aristos. Um, Please, forgive me. Uh, I asked you before we went on air if you minded talking about your age, so I'm going to just say you're 49 years old. That's you don't look a day over 21, darling. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, you have been living with HIV for some years. Yeah, about 15 years now. Now, 49, I'm going to go on record and say, is not ageing yet, all right? And uh, I think my dad is listening, and he's a few years past that, so if 49 is ageing, I'm going to get near bashing from him after I come off air. Um, you do a lot of work with uh, um, Positive Speakers Bureau, that's right. Um, just tell us a little bit about that organisation a little bit. Okay. Um, Positive Speakers Bureau is uh, it's run through Living Positive Victoria. And basically, um, people who are living with HIV are sent out to talk uh, to schools and community groups um, just to talk about our experience of living with HIV so that people can put a face to the disease. And uh, we also uh, promote safe sex messages as well. So um, listening to uh, the research that Carolyn's carrying out, is that music to your ears? Do you think that that is um, a certainly a message that you will carry on and it, because you're, by your very nature, a communicative person? And, and is this part of the message you're going to incorporate, that there is now help not just for young people but also the aging community as well? Well, yeah, I think, I, I mean, I read on the internet doing a little bit of research this morning that 30% uh, of people in Australia with HIV are actually over the age of 50 now, so it is okay. great to know that services are being made available. It's slightly worrying to hear that someone did some research on the internet this morning. <laughs> I should probably have done something along those lines before coming on air. <laughs> yeah. um, and you also do a little bit of work with uh, uh, positive, uh, Living Positive Victoria. Um, what exactly? I think you've just started a project with them. It's in quite um, infancy stages, but... Yes, well, not not I haven't started it, but um, the, a project was um, started recently. Um, it's called the Senior Voices Project, and uh, a grant was secured from the federal government of, uh, I think it was $3 million. Uh, so the project's going to be run initially for a period of, uh, I think it's two years, and somebody is em uh, employed specifically to actually create this project from the ground up. And basically it involves getting uh, people over the age of 50 uh, to go in to talk about their experience of um, living with HIV and um, basically to nursing homes, I guess, so that the ageing uh, HIV population will be treated with respect and dignity. That brings us 
quite poetically and beautifully, I didn't organise that by any means, uh, <laughs> on to our, our third guest in the studio, Paul Mathewson. Uh, as said before, you are the owner of a franchise of one of 20 um, HISC, which is Home Instead Senior Care, not the uh, Hunter Ice Skating Club. Skim over that one. Uh, now, uh, this is, how long have you been, uh, have been the franchise holder of HISC? Yeah, for three years now. So October of 2010, we started operation in the southern suburbs of Melbourne. So this is an aged care service for people who are still in their own homes? Exactly. So we're providing services directly to people in their own homes. Now this contrasts slightly because you're actually visiting residential homes? Well, the project has just uh, started quite recently, so it's still in its sort of embryonic stages, but that is the plan, to, to engage a, a group of uh, speakers specifically for the Senior Voices project. With yeah. reference specifically to the ageing HIV community, why do you think mm. it's important that um, you offer at home uh, aged care? Well, I think it's about giving people a choice and, and clearly across uh, ageing populations more generally, people are wanting to stay at home where possible and rather than going into nursing care, but obviously for some people that is um, an option for them as well. Um, but a lot of people are now looking for solutions, looking for ways to stay at home and to be doing that safely and, and to do that in a way where they're still in their home environment. And there's research that does say that um, people are often happier at home and are more likely to um, be sometimes healthier at home as well and have the services go to them rather than um, provide these services in a clinical setting or a nursing home setting. With regard to that, we're talking about sort of people's health. Um, and I don't think anyone in here are sort of qualified to speak on from a medical perspective, but um, in your experiences, the ageing HIV community, are they more susceptible to illnesses? Do, do they require more health care? Look, it's early days, I think, from our perspective, and this is the perspective of providing non-medical services to people in their own homes. Uh, I, I guess for us, we're, we're keen to see how the trends unfold and uh, while thinking about trends we're also really there to provide a service that's very uh, much tailored to the, the services and the needs of, of that person. So um, in many ways we're not wanting to group people too much but equally we want to know what, what some of that research is telling us how we can improve our services. Sure. Yeah, I, I guess I can add to that a little bit. Um, I'm also involved in another project that's running out of the Monash and Alfred. Um, which is a project that's aiming to reduce cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV, and that will go into trial um, early next year. So we certainly know from um, all of the research that people um, ageing with HIV are um, not living quite as long as as the rest of the population, um, th but there's, there's still some uh, information missing about why that is. So it may be that um, it's a... Um, the prolonged experience of living with um, a, a, an illness or a, an infection that has an, a response in your immune system. Um, it could be long-term treatment um, and some of the potential toxicities that may be involved in that. Um, and then there are other lifestyle and uh, uh, risk factor things like um, smoking. We have a lot of um, lot higher smoking in the HIV positive population than in the general population. It's more than double. So, um, the, you know, there are a number of things that could be contributing to this. Um, and then there's uh, all, all of the normal ageing diseases like cancer, liver, uh, renal disease, those kinds of things that are, um, you know, part of, part of growing older. But we're yet to know yet whether HIV is having an influence on that or whether... Um, Dementia was the one that you didn't mention, but I have heard mentioned mm. in sort of medical circles, yeah. possibly being tied into HIV. Um, it, what's the research that's surrounding that at the moment? Is there any link found yet, or is it really only... Sort so, of again, I can't speak authoritatively sure, sure. on this issue. Um, you know, we certainly had a lot of dementia in the earlier days before effective treatment. Um, these days, with effective treatment um, and particularly, you know, earlier diagnosis and effective early treatment, um, I think the cognitive issues are le less of a concern. But, that, that, again, I can only speak very broadly to that. Sure. Um, Back to you for a moment, uh, Paul. Someone earlier I was mentioning that I was going to be doing this segment, and um, the question I'm sure has been raised before, uh, that because um, people have, perhaps living with HIV, have more requirements for their own privacy and to stay at home, um, what is the, the scope and the question for, um, say, gay uh, residential care homes? 
with your areas of expertise, is that something that anyone has considered? Now, I know what I can sort of preempt part of the answer, and that is I believe um, certainly in Victoria people are, should have access to residential care at least within five kilometres of, of their, their own home. What are the possibilities of introducing, say, a network of, of gay residential care homes? Look, I think that is, is an emerging demand that's being placed on residential care services. And I think at the moment, um, within that group care model, unfortunately, everyone's individual needs are grouped together. And in that setting, at times, those individual needs at the moment, when they're put in a mainstream setting, are often not, not met terribly well. And it really depends, I guess, on the, the staffing resources and the, the staffing culture sometimes within the residential care settings. Uh, I think, though, in time, there'll be more of a demand placed on this sector to say, well, we want something that's going to meet our needs better. And at the moment, they're not always being met terribly well. That also goes into the community sector as well. We need to be employing, we call them caregivers at home instead, but uh, I guess that's just to put that distinction between carers, family carers, for example, and paid carers, and we call them caregivers. But I guess the, the pressure on us will be to ensure that we can have caregivers that are going to have the, the right attributes and skills to, to be servicing this community well. Um, your organisation is particularly sensitive to people living with, with HIV. Um, do you think that there is a shortfall in the training given to uh, residential care workers or caregivers as you refer to them? Um, do you think that there is definitely more scope for people to be trained in preparedness for an emerging HIV community going into aged care? I certainly do. I, I really do believe that. Um, hearing what Carolyn's having to say as well will be important. Um, not just with her project, but other research that comes to bear about how we can improve services across the board. Um, having said that, some of those trends can sometimes lead to stereotyping, and I think we need to also, um, while that knowledge is important, also remember that we need to be listening to what the client is needing. And each person is going to have individual needs, and we, as a, a community care provider, we need to accommodate those. In the residential setting, I think that's trickier, and I'm not being critical of the of that sector as such. But the pressures that they have, you know, make that more challenging for them. But that's going to be a big challenge for them to be able to accommodate those individual needs as well. Um, Sebastian, in no means picking on anyone because of their age or anything. Um, uh, as a person living with HIV, what would you expect from uh, society? growing older in both in terms of what care you are offered and also uh, perception um, we can talk at length as many of the other segments have today about stigma but start maybe with what you would ex expect from um, living in Australia uh, and what care you would receive mm -hmm. well I guess um, part of the work that we do through the positive speakers bureau is to inform people about the um, you know how to how to treat uh, people who are HIV positive and I think uh, if people are aware of um, the fact that, um, you know, it is a bloodborne virus, so they're not going to be in any danger of actually contracting the virus through, you know, the work that they do um, as caregivers, well, then I guess that's really important for people to know. Um, I guess I really haven't thought um, too much about the concept of ageing, uh, you know, I, well, this, the whole... Uh, um, that was the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Even if you have, I would still say respond as such. Yeah, the whole Senior Voices project is just really new. So, um, I mean, obviously, um, people, you know, people going into uh, aged care will have to perhaps um, confront the issues of potential disclosure. And, um, you know, there's hopefully going to be some sensitivity around that issue. And so if people in the... Um, you know, the, if the service providers are both sensitive to and aware of their needs, that's going to be really important. You know, and obviously the fact that you know people deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. 
absolutely right. We have plenty more to talk about, I'm sure. We're only just scratching the surface. We're going to take a quick break. If you are listening or watching, for that matter, please do stay in touch. We want to know what your take on the situation is. If any of our lovely guests are saying things that get your, get your opinions up, then we want to hear about that. There's two ways you can get in touch. There's onair at joy.org.au is the email, or you can uh, uh, get on worldsaidsdayworldwide.org is the, uh, the website to watch us, or Twitter, hashtag joywad. We'll be back straight away. Welcome back. A little break there, but we're back straight back into it. Uh, you're with Daniel on Joy 94.9. We are here on this momentous occasion, uh, World AIDS Day. If you want to get in touch, uh, I'd love to hear uh, what you have to say. Um, if you have any similar experiences that we're talking about that we, we, you, you think you'd like to pass on, we can uh, give you a shout out. Uh, everyone deserves their five minutes of fame. On air at joy.org.au is the email, or you can use the Twitter hashtag joywad. Before the break, we were talking to Sebastian. Uh, you were telling us a little bit more about uh, the uh, Emerging Project Senior Voices Program uh, and exactly the work that you were doing. Um, before the break, what was it you were saying pr previously? Uh, basically that um, the federal government has given, I think, uh, $3 million to uh, create a project so that uh, uh, people over the age of 50 can go out, uh, you know, people living with HIV can go out uh, and talk in residential care to the staff, uh, educating the staff about uh, how best to to help and to treat uh, people with HIV and, um, you know, promoting messages, I guess, around sensitivity and respect. Now, off air, because you can, I can't shut these guys up, honestly. They do, what was the conversation you having? It seems like we, we're networking while we're on the airwaves. Uh, there was a conversation that began right here. This could be a happy union, you said, Paul. Exactly. I, I, was, I was thinking that uh, while the residential care setting is certainly a, uh, a good um, starting point for that project, it would be great if it actually uh, got out a little bit further into... Uh, providers of direct care services because I think there's a lot for us to learn in that, that space as well. Sure. Good. Well, who knows? This could be the start of something. Um, government funding of $3 million? Yeah, and that's f initially for a period of two years and um, Living Positive Victoria is hoping that uh, that will be extended. Uh, how far? I mean, $3 million, you know, I, I see it as plasma s screens and, you know, material. How far does $3 million get you? I don't know. Is how much money are we talking here? Is that a lot for your cause or well, do you need has, more? Somebody has been employed specifically to, uh, in, a, in the position to, um, I guess, um, take care of the Senior Voices Project and there's going to be training for, for the people involved. So I'm not really sure about uh, budgeting and, you know, how that's, uh, I'm, I'm perhaps uh, you're interested in participating as one of the, the positive speakers, but I don't necessarily know a huge amount of how the money's going to be spent. I, I feel like there's sort of recruitment going on all the time. <laughs> I find that if you cough and say an amount under your cough, that sort of can have a really subliminal effect, actually. It can I, work I'm well. sure if anyone wants to make any donations, though, that would be greatly appreciated, <laughs> if that's what you're suggesting. Very, very good. We'll come back to that a little bit later. <laughs> on the subject of government funding, I believe your research is being partly funded uh, by government contribution. That's right. So the Positive Ageing Project that I mentioned first is funded by the Victorian Government, Department of Health, and then the, the trial that... I mentioned the Health Map trial, which is the trial aim to introduce cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV, is funded by an NH and MRC grant, so National Health and Medical Research Council grant, which is a federally uh, funded research pool, I guess, for these kinds of projects. And how do you go about applying for that sort of funding? I mean, what do you have to pitch, and is it something that the government is is already ready for? You know, they have a certain allocation to causes so, like yourself? Yeah, so there is a certain amount of um, Commonwealth money that is is allocated to blood-borne virus uh, work that goes to a number of centres in, um, well, predominantly Melbourne and Sydney uh, to do that kind of work. And then, and then this kind of project is a um, very long process of writing grants and... Um, and then going in a uh, very competitive pool to receive funding to then carry out the research. So, Do you think there is an added focus and interest on particularly Melbourne-based research because, of course, we've got um, AIDS 2014 coming up in July next year? Do you think that there's a, a particular focus on this part of the world at the moment? Um, I think, well, certainly with, I mean, the Victorian-funded study, it, you know, because it's, it's, uh, it was an election promise made by the Victorian government, so that's why that's um, limited to Victoria. The other trial that I mentioned is, a, is, is much wider and 
I'm not sure that it's in every state and territory, but it's much wider than just Victoria. So, um, but certainly we are getting um, a lot of attention on um, the up and coming conference, and um, and it's uh, you know it's fantastic that um, hopefully there'll be a national dialogue about HIV in a way that there hasn't, and um, uh, you know one can only hope that that can really make um, great contributions to reduction of stigma in Australia because it's. Um, still a very um, prominent issue. In fact, probably one of the most daily prominent issues for people living with HIV. It certainly comes through in all of our research findings, um, which is why the work of what the Positive Speakers Bureau does is so important because they can help break down some of those barriers and misconceptions about infection and the kinds of people that have HIV and what that means. And so, um, yeah, I think my greatest hope for um, AIDS 2014 is, is that national dialogue that will happen around um, HIV because I think you know we have such a small epidemic in Australia it tends to get marginalized or sidelined to um, those in the know and we all talk about it you know every day and it's um, you know within our uh, reality but for the vast majority of people it isn't and I think it could really help to have those bigger broader conversations. There is actually there's an unspoken rule with it within any interview and that is if you manage to get all three other people in the studio to nod sagely at the same time <laughs> <laughs> by saying just one word, then you won that award. Right. I should have said that. I probably should have mentioned it before we went on air. But by, by mentioning the word stigma, I, as I say off air, you know, virtually every conversation that has happened in this studio today mentions it. In your experience dealing with the AIDS community, where does, where does stigma, how does it affect, where does it lie? Look, I think even just in the broader ageing community, there is stigma associated with with people who see older people as being... Uh, incapable of making decisions, incapable of voicing their preferences and and wishes to people. Um, sometimes, you know, there is a sense that we need to do everything for a, for an ageing person, and yet we need to give them opportunities to be able to undertake their activities of daily living and give them the full opportunity of leaving leading, you know, a full life. Uh, but I think at times there are those uh, broader. Um, stigmas and and uh, preconceived ideas about people as we get older. We've got a, a caregiver employed by us who's in their mid 70s so they're actually providing a, a role as a caregiver and, and I didn't appreciate that when I first started at home instead that we'd in fact have people of that age but it's also opened my eyes to the fact that it is a very hard thing to draw a line in the sand to say well over this particular age you are now an old person even. I think that is um, a tricky area to go into. Mm. You make a great point, you know, while we're majority of the time speaking about the HIV and AIDS affected communities, there's stigma attached to just being old. Exactly. Which is, you know, that's a societal thing that we should be doing a lot about as well. Yeah, and I think we often forget that these people uh, can of course contribute to our society at any age and even for um, this uh, caregiver that we have, you know, he does a great job providing companionship and, and social support services for older people living at home. He does, takes uh, people to medical appointments and out shopping and helps with personal care. It's fantastic. It's given him a new lease of life. He didn't think he was a valuable contributor at his age, but oh. responded to our ad and it, it's been fantastic. What a lovely story. Mm. Um, I've been neglecting my messages, actually, which is very naughty of me, but I'm going to read a few now because we've had quite a response from, from our listeners and viewers. Um, there's one question here which says, uh, how do you use younger folk in inverted commas, which I'm assuming means that's come from an, an older person, uh, to support our ageing HIV positive members of, of uh, the community? How, so how can younger people get involved to, to assist in uh, older members of the community? I can perhaps answer that one. Um, there's um, definitely uh, an option of volunteering for places like the, the Victorian AIDS Council uh, or um, you know the Living Positive um, Centre here. Um, they're always looking for volunteers and there's lots of different uh, capacities that people can get involved in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also another question, uh, how could uh, philanthropic organisations support um, the ageing HIV community? community? Um, it's, it's quite a, an out there question. I don't know whether anyone's going to be uh, brave enough to dive in on that one. Well, I, get, I guess um, most of the organisations, um, universities, departments, you know, they're always happy to receive, um, you know, philanthropic. It doesn't happen a lot, certainly in my experience. Um, but 
those kinds of um, gifts can be given to universities and administered with a particular focus if, um, if that's something that people are thinking they'd like to do. It's certainly possible. Um, do you find that there, in your research, you, obviously you have to start from, um, I don't know, I, I perhaps should have asked you a little bit about your background. How, how did your research arrive at dealing with um, uh, the HIV and AIDS affected communities? With regard to my personal yeah, journey through research, yeah. I guess I started at the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society 17 years ago and was involved in um, the first HIV Futures Survey, which I'm sure a number of your listeners will be um, familiar with. It's a nationwide survey of positive people in Australia and that's run, it was initially every two years, it's now every three, collects a vast um, amount of data on a variety of topics about the social um, experience of living with HIV. Um, and then I um, developed an interest particularly in women's experiences of living with HIV and their reprodu reproductive decision making. Um, and then, as I said, more recently moved into the area of ageing and, um, and, then, and then this trial that I'm involved in. So I guess I've worked in a num across a number of experiences. But um, I guess I want to steer the conversation back to stigma because I feel like we've only just sort of touched on it. But um, it's certainly something that has come up in every project I have ever been involved in and um, I think uh, with regard to ageing you know one of the main findings that came through our qualitative study of the Victorians ageing with HIV was the experience um, of social isolation and that's that's often driven by um, uh, people having less uh, money and being less able to contribute in their social worlds that they may have been able to. Um, but it may also be uh, because of some physical disability or illness, meaning they can't participate physically in the way that they have. Um, and then there are whole lots of issues about disclosure and um, whether or not, you know, if you were to join a new group, um, making those decisions about whether or not you disclose um, can be very challenging for people. So. Um, I think, just, you know, despite the great advances that we have in terms of treatment and longevity with HIV, we've still, there's still always going to be um, support required for people around stigma and disclosure in particular. In an ideal world, $64,000 question, I know, but in an ideal world, where do we start to, to break down these walls of stigma? What, what, in your opinion, would be the most targeted course of action? Yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned, though, having those broader conversations so that it's not just confined to those working in the area or even just the gay community, which I think it predominantly is. It's not part of the um, heterosexual mainstream community. Um, so I think having those broader conversations would be really helpful. But I think also even within gay community, um, you know, one of your uh, listeners asked the question about young people. Um, I think having those conversations and, and recognising that HIV still is very much a part of the gay community and the broader community, but um, and, and making the space for that and participating in the kinds of events where um, those... Um, or where the uh, long history of HIV is remembered and celebrated, like World AIDS Day and the many events that um, are attached to this day every year. Um, but I think it's, in a lot of ways, it's, um, it's much... I think it's a broader problem in terms of younger people being um, involved in older people. I think it's a... You know, it's a, again, it's a kind of conversation we could be having nationally about what older people, you know, do and the kinds of contributions that they make in our society and... Um, and doing a better job of valuing our older members of society. But again, that's that's an issue not related to, to people living with that's HIV right. and AIDS. Yeah. Yep. So we, we're getting back to the core here of what the, the actual problem is. Um, Sebastian, you've been living with HIV for, for a few years now. Um, how have you found that in your personal experience firsthand, the uh, society's sort of um, reaction to HIV positive people has changed, if at all? Uh, yeah, look, I've been HIV positive for about 15 years and I guess I was very fortunate in terms of the fact that um, when I seroconverted and became HIV positive, uh, it was already considered a, a chronic manageable illness rather than a death sentence. So, uh, But uh, the experience of uh, coming out as HIV positive is similar in many ways to coming out as, uh, as being gay. Um, because of the stigma attached to it and you just simply don't know how people are going to react? Well, that's true and I think the, 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 the one of the most difficult challenges is, I think is dealing with um, you know, my, my own feelings about that or 
I guess, uh, you know, in, in, in a similar way to um, the experience of coming out as gay, often it's the internalized homophobia, which is the most challenging thing because I, you know, as an adult, I guess I haven't faced a lot of um, stigma and, and discrimination. However, there, there is still a level of, of shame and guilt associated with, uh, you know, having a sexually transmitted disease. And I guess, um, you know, the reason I didn't initially tell my family was because of that. Now, there's actually a, a, a story worth telling. You mentioned um, how you went about telling your family, or your parents specifically, I think it was, not it? T- tell me the, the story that we talked about off, off air. Yeah, well, uh, when I became HIV positive, um, I initially decided that I wasn't going to tell my family because um, I didn't, uh, I wasn't sure how well educated they were around that. And I just assumed that they would worry unnecessarily. And, um, but as it turned out, I was at the, um, the Alfred Hospital uh, one day on the, at the seventh floor where um, HIV patients are treated. And I bumped into my, uh, my third cousin, who was also HIV positive, and he casually mentioned to my mum that he'd seen me. And so <laughs> I guess at that stage, the, uh, the cat came out of the bag. And, you know, it, it was actually a positive thing in the end because, um, you know, I've been able to, to be open and honest with my family about that, and they've been really supportive. So, But you, you were fortunate in that instance. How often do you think um, there is negativity, even in, in family groups, when people... Uh, decide to declare their their um, HIV status. Well, sadly, there's still a lot of um, negativity uh, associated with um, you know with, with being gay, and I know this is not just obviously a, an issue for um, for gay people, but um, I guess for a lot of people, you know, I've I've heard of experiences where uh, people actually haven't been open about their sexuality to family members, and so it's only when um, uh, you know they've become HIV positive and. You know, I know a story of uh, somebody who became HIV positive, I think about 20 years ago, and, and became ill and actually had to um, come out to his, his family as, you know, look, I've got, um, I've got HIV and, you know, I'm also gay. Double whammy. Yeah, so disclosure can be a, a significant issue for a lot of people. You, you, yeah, you I think, uh, and that's, uh, if we bring it, you know, bringing the conversation back to um, s- the use of services by people who are ageing with HIV or as they age with HIV, um, this is one of the, the great concerns about um, about interacting with mainstream services. I mean, obviously, you know, they know that they're going to get um, great non-judgmental care from the HIV services, but the HIV services can't provide all of the care that's required. Um, and they do need, they all are, you know, may need to interface with those mainstream services. And, and a lot of the anxiety is about how they're going to be treated, but also the fact that often it may involve a double disclosure. And I've also had um, people say to me, well, as soon as people know you're gay, they'll assume I'm positive. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it works both ways, I guess, that, you know, the stigma um, goes both ways, not just with people who are HIV, but sometimes, you know, just announcing that you're gay, people will make assumptions. So, um, you know, and this is some of the, the things that people have said about um, going into residential care or using those mainstream services about, you know, how much do they have to disclose and what kinds of assumptions are going to be made and, and then how they're going to be treated if they are disclose, if they do disclose their status. So, um, yeah, which is something we've touched on. Um, I have, I, sorry, just, have you been reading my messages, Karen? You <laughs> no. Know? Because I, I'm a little bit defensive about them. Am I going to have to turn the monitor around a bit just to make sure? Because that was one of our messages from a listener. You preempted that nicely. Um, what is your take? On, exactly, we're now sort of branching back into the residential care question. Mm. Um, your experience of the same? Look, I think I think there's a lot to learn in the mainstream area. And as a as Home Instead is a private provider of services, we're a mainstream service. So there's a number of different... Um, issues that we're trying to um, be better better to serve and, and having staff that are very um, adequate in being able to provide services, not just for um, ageing people with HIV, but a, a broad range of, of conditions that affect older people. Um, so, you know, f- for us, I think it's also about information sharing, and I know that the aged care system is a maze to navigate through at the best of times. So, you know, the issues that Carolyn's raised are one part of that, but it's also the fact of just getting information in a in a mainstream setting about what services are available, let alone the issues that could come from that, from stigma and 
um, ignorance, I guess, in the broader sense, uh, uh, compounded as well. We talk about people's um, reluctance to both declare their HIV status and also their sexuality. Um, if someone is uh, either um, gay or HIV, um, living with HIV AIDS, um, and they are put into either residential or any other sort of care, mm. um, at that point, if their HIV status is required or has to be disclosed, could that be seen as them sort of being... Fo the assumption often is that if a man is HIV positive, they a man has sex with other men. Um, is that unfairly kind of outing someone in an environment which they absolutely would not want to come out in? You know, if they've, if they've managed to live out a majority of their life um, with that as their own personal information, mm. do you think there is a, a risk that uh, you may be inadvertently outing someone by... I would think so. I mean, I would be interested to hear from Sebastian Carolyn, but I would I would think so, that we are putting, it's, you know, almost like a mathematical equation, someone with HIV, therefore, um, must be gay, you know, and, uh, and I... It's precisely what you were saying before, is yeah. that, yeah, there's often that misconception. That's right. And, and the thing about going into, you know, if you, if you do require um, residential care, at that point, your medication, et cetera, becomes the responsibility of someone else. So mm. at that point, someone is going to know about your HIV status because, um, you know, you're going to be, it's very likely that you're going to be on antiretrovirals. So, um, but, so again, it comes back to um, training, really good training of, of all of the staff. Um, and also, I guess, an understanding about an, a need to know basis. Um, mm. You know, not, not everybody needs to know um, because, um, as we said before, it's, um, you know, it's not a highly right. infectious disease. So um, I think it's just a question of, you know, those that need to know in order to provide the best care should know. And, and then apart from that, it's entirely up to then to the individual as to who knows. Mm. I'm pleased that we started this discussion because, you know, the best thing we can do is talk about it. That's the purpose of, uh, of having this uh, broadcast from Joy 94.9 today on, you know, a really important day. This, is, uh, this has been really, really good. Thank you so much for, for your insight on this. It's been a really good sort of little collection of, um, of opinions and expertise. Uh, we look forward to hearing all about it from your respective uh, positions. Um, thank you so much for listening. If you want to get in touch, on air at joy.org.au is the email, or you can use the Twitter hashtag joy. W-A-D. Until a little bit later at midnight, and if you're not completely sick of the sight of me, I will be back on, but uh, stick around. There's plenty coming up. <laughs>